our recording. Okay. Great. Well, welcome everyone to the March 17th, uh, 2022 planning board meeting. Uh, we have uh, five planning board members with us. We have one absence, Peter Vitali, and one uh, one vacant seat. So that is a, and that is a quorum. So we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, let's see, before we proceed, I'll be handing it over. I believe Cindy, you'll be giving us the uh, rules of participation in virtual meeting today, tonight. Yes, I will. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah, let me get my screen ready really quickly. All right. Ought to do as one person here. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I'm looking at the participants list because I know there was a participant that emailed you and I'm not seeing them yet. Hopefully they're not having trouble getting um, in. I do see one. I do see one of them here. Yes, I do. Well, see okay, them. great. I do Excellent. Because yeah. I, I know they wanted to talk to us during the public hearing. Can you see my screen? Yes. It says public participation at board meetings. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, everyone, thank you for coming to our planning board meeting tonight. We're all glad that you are here. We aim to keep these meetings respectful and orderly. As such, we have some specific protocol for our meetings. The city is engaged with our community members to create or co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for our community members, staff, and council, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. You can find more about this on our website. And if you have questions about that, I'll be happy to send that link to you. Um, the following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimonies shall be limited to matters limited to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, dehumanizing language, racial, racial epitaphs, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals can display their whole name before being allowed to speak. And currently, only audio testimony is being allowed. Um, we are in a Zoom webinar. It's not a Zoom meeting. So if you do have, um, when we get to the time when we have public speaking, um, you will go down to the bottom of your screen and you can hover and you'll see a raised hand. You can click that and then it will know that you wanna speak when it's during, during public speaking time. If you are on the phone, we may have some people later on that call in, um, you will use a star nine. And just another note that I'd like to talk about real quickly is um, since we are in a webinar, um, all attendees will use the Q&A function down at the bottom. Again, you'll cover down at the bottom, it'll say Q&A. This is for technical questions only, not for content. We do not allow um, discussion of content in the Q&A. Our board members are, and staff are not reading this. It is not for debate. And, um, and if I see that you um, are constantly using that for uh, debate or for um, con content questions, I may, I'm going to give you some warning. And if you, but if you keep abusing that, I may have to interrupt our chair and ask that um, they address it. Um, and I don't want to do that. So let's all just use it for technical questions. And that's it. I'll put it back over to you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, all right, well, um, uh, our first item after call to order is approval of the minutes. And uh, we have two sets of minutes that Cindy sent out. And I just wanna say that um, these, you know, I'm always just amazed at the quality of the minutes that come out. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, uh, anyone, did anyone have any comments on the minutes or wanna make a motion? I see John's hand and uh, Lisa, maybe you want a second? Go ahead, John, do you wanna? Yeah, I'll move to approve uh, both sets of the minutes, actually. <laughs> Great, then I'll Lisa? I'll second approval, or yep, I'll second approval of both sets of minutes. 
Awesome. Okay, let's just do a show of hands. All in favor? I see five hands, so we're unanimous. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's move on then to the public participation portion of our meeting. Uh, this is the time where all members of the public are invited to talk to us about anything that's on your mind. Uh, you have three minutes uh, maximum per speaker uh, during participation, and uh, we'll be uh, looking at your hands in the participants list. So you can start raising your hands if you would like to speak to us tonight. Uh, we do have one public hearing item, and that is something that you will not talk about during this public hearing or uh, public, uh, uh, yeah, public hearing. So, um, or public participation. So the one uh, public hearing we have is for 777 Poplar. Uh, it is a concept re re uh, use review and parking reduction on 777 Poplar. So if you have comments on that one, please wait until that item comes up later in this meeting. Otherwise for everything else, including uh, the use table uh, discussion we're going to have during matters, feel free to uh, address us now on those. So with that, I'll go ahead and have Cindy help me with unmuting. Um, I see Tim Breen followed by Stephen Eckert. Tim, you should be able to unmute. I, I think I just did. Um, yeah, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, my name is Tim Breen. I'm the head of school at Watershed School, uh, an independent school here in Boulder. I wanna speak in strong support of one of the functional fixes that you're considering, and that is streamlining the use tables to group like uses together. In particular, in the definition section of module one, the idea of combining the similar uses private elementary, junior, and senior high schools, and public elementary, junior, and senior high schools. As a nonprofit independent school, we're categorized as a private school in the use tables, and currently we are not allowed in as many zones as the public schools because these uses are separated. This is a matter of some urgency for us because we're currently renting our space and we are working to buy a property and put down permanent roots in the community. We're hoping to be able to do this in Boulder. If we were allowed in the same zones as public schools, this would make a huge difference for us and our families, opening up many potential locations. This streamlining fix for the use tables would also be good for other independent schools in Boulder. At Watershed, we believe that schools should be embedded in their communities, engaging students in projects that make a contribution to the common good, working with partner organizations to help improve the community, and sharing our facilities with members of the local community. We believe that this is a great way to help students learn about citizenship and see the impact they can have in our communities. The change you're considering, simplifying the use tables to allow private schools where public schools are already allowed, would enable us to be truly embedded in a community. This would make it easier for us to have a site that is walkable for our students to local businesses and local partners, and a site where public transportation can provide safe routes to school. We shared a letter with the planning board in January with more detail about this issue. And we're also just very pleased to see that this is a change the planning board had already been considering. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak and thank you for your service to the community. I appreciate your time and dedication. Thank you, Tim. Um, we appreciate those comments. And um, yes, um, I remember seeing the uh, email that was sent earlier this year. So I'll just acknowledge that. And uh, then we'll move on to uh, Stephen Eckert. Stephen, you should be able to unmute. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, so I got a brief statement. Uh, thank you to the members of the planning board for this opportunity to speak tonight and thank you for your service. Um, my name is Stephen Eckert and I'm an architect with CAS Collaborative. Uh, here in Boulder. I'm also a parent of two daughters that attend independent schools in Boulder. Um, as stated before tonight, you guys will be updated on the status of the second phase of the use table and standards project and also be asked for your feedback on that proposal. Um, I want to express my support and enthusiasm for the change in definitions in module one that combines private <coughs> junior and senior high schools with public junior and senior high schools. Over the past few years, CADIS has worked with a number of independent schools in Boulder, including the Friends School, Gerald Montessori, Watershed, among others, um, that have embarked on the journey of finding new locations or supplementary facilities within Boulder. 
Much of the search has been difficult or impossible within the city of Boulder as the use tables precludes available sites. This change of definition would be a game changer, opening up properties that would, be a, that would allow cherished independent schools to provide facilities that encourage pedestrian use and provide safe routes to school. This change would also keep independent schools from moving outside of the city of Boulder, a move that increases traffic to and from the city. Most importantly, keeping highly regarded treasured schools within the city limits. Uh, I'm thrilled as a parent and a professional that you're weighing in on this important yet quite simple change to the use tables and standards. And I encourage you to send a strong message of support for this change. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you so much, Stephen. All right. So I, I'll give a last call then uh, for anyone else in attendance who would like to raise their hand. Uh, and seeing no other hands, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close the general uh, public participation uh, section. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, the item on uh, use tables will come up after this next public hearing item, just uh, for your information. And so it will be a little, little bit of uh, time will elapse. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling on words here, but um, I'm listening through headphones. I'm not used to it. Uh, discussion of dispositions, planning board call-ups and continuations. Uh, seeing none, we'll go ahead and go to the public hearing item for tonight. Uh, this is a public hearing and consideration of a use review, LUR 2021-00030, an administrative parking reduction, ADR 2022-00033, to legitimize existing non-residential uses at 777 Poplar Avenue within the residential low RL2 zoning district. The site is within the area originally conceived as the village center of Wonderland Hills. Uh, and uh, the Wonderland Hill 4 Planned Unit Development, or PUD. So before we start this item, uh, this is a uh, quasi-judicial item, so I'd like to ask the board if there are any potential conflicts of interests or ex parte communication uh, that you would like to disclose. All right, uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, in uh, the neighborhood that I grew up in and uh, still uh, live in, but it's uh, I live uh, a distance greater than 600 feet away, and I feel that I can be uh, objective and fair in this uh, matter. Hey, thank you, John. Great. So seeing no other uh, hands on that, uh, we'll go ahead and start the staff presentation. Um, uh, I see Sloan on, and I don't know if Charles, you wanted to introduce this item. No, not at all. Um, good evening, uh, members of the board. Sloan Walbert, our city planner, uh, senior planner rather, will present tonight's analysis. Thank you, Charles. All right, thanks, Charles. Let me pull this up. Is everyone able to see the presentation? Yes. All right, awesome. This out of the way. <clears throat> so um, thanks for the introduction there, Mr. Chair. Um, just to sort of set up the conversation a little bit, the necessity for this use review arose when a prospective buyer of one of the condominium spaces approached the city to gain more surety on the allowable uses within those condominium spaces. At that time, um, some research, research was done and it was determined that the required use review for the non-residential uses was not completed, even though a use review was required at the time. Um, that said, the, the development's been existing since um, you know, the early 1980s. So this would really just be to um, legitimize the non-residential uses in um, the land use records. Um, so in terms of site location, it is located in the Wonderland Hill neighborhood, um, north of Poplar Avenue between Queens Circle and Wonderland Hill Avenue, and Wonderland Lake is less than a quarter mile to the north of the site. The site contains two two-story buildings constructed circa 1980 and a surface parking lot accessed from Poplar. 
Um, the subject building, which is 777 Poplar, um, contains 10 condominium units, five of which are residential and five contain commercial offices or like um, uses. The office condominiums are accessed from a sin single entry door and a shared atrium at the center of the building. Um, permit records are, are not consistent, but they over time refer to these spaces as studios, studio shops, or office spaces. And the other building on the site, which is 717 Poplar, contains a single office space, which is used by the Wild Foundation. Um, the surrounding area is characterized by a mix of attached housing units, small office buildings, and community amenities. The property is part of the larger 80-acre Wonderland Hill Master PUD, which was originally approved in the late 1960s, along with the annexation proposal, it was later amended in the 1970s. Um, the conceptual plans from 1973 are shown here. The red um, star is sort of the general location of the site. At that time, it was considered or planned for a commercial center for the entire development. And um, it was noted, you can't see it here, but it was noted for a daycare and commercial center. So along with um, an adjacent office building to the east at 3985 Wonderland Hill Avenue, the site um, is considered outlaw F of the subdivision plot. And this, the subdivision plot included some notes for the planned use of the site. Um, so you can see here, it was planned for neighborhood shops and offices. And more specifically, it was a village center approved to include 6,000 square feet of shops and offices, 1,600 square foot daycare facility, and five artisan units. Um, we think that these five condominium spaces were probably originally the artisan units, and that could be why they never went through the required use review. Um, just generally, the community center was envisioned as part of the plans to provide convenience services and facilities for the neighborhood, and the, um, the daycare use was never constructed. Um, the site and the surrounding area are zoned RL2 which was established when that PUD was approved. To end when the site was annexed. The applicant is requesting approval of the use to review to officially convert those five non-residential condominium units in the building into commercial spaces suitable for professional offices, technical offices, professional services, or art or craft studio spaces. And the current occupants include providers of functional health, health supplements, trauma counseling, tax, advi tax advisory services, et cetera. Um, so these uses would fit into these general categories. And um, office hours are generally 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Also as part of the proposal in order to accommodate visitors and patrons to the non-residential uses, the applicant is proposing to relocate the existing six lot bike rack um, from its current location to a more visible and accessible location in the entry courtyard, which is closer to the entrance, and also add a U-style rack to the courtyard shown here on the southeast side of the building, which would add a total of eight short-term spaces They've also arranged to ensure that long-term bike parking for employees would be um, provided within each non-residential space. Um, so as I described, the proposal would require a use review for those five uses proposed to operate in the RL2 zoning district. The use review would clarify the allowable square footage of these spaces, the allowable uses, um, general operating characteristics. And the official conversion of the floor area would result in a parking, a greater parking requirement for the development, since parking for non-residential uses is calculated at one space per 300 square feet of floor area. So if you're looking at the entirety of outlaw F, the site provides 33 spaces where 42 would be required. And that requires a 22% parking reduction. Um, that would generally be administered or 
considered through an administrative application by staff. But according to the code, if um, if a parking reduction is being considered with a concurrent use review, it's referred to the planning board for a decision. And also just want to point out that the use review for a non-residential use in a residential zone requires um, decision by the planning board at a public hearing. So in terms of public notification, um, the notice was posted on the property and a mail notice was sent out. We did receive some inquiries from neighboring property owners, but no formal comment was made on the proposal. Um, most people were just curious as to why the use review was required 40 years later. So in terms of key issues, the first would be whether the proposal is consistent with the use review criteria. And the second would be whether the parking reduction was is consistent with the criteria in the code. So in terms of consistency with the use review criteria, staff finds that the proposal is consistent. Um, the proposed uses are consistent with the original vision for the property in the PUD as sort of a mixed use community center. Um, thus the proposed uses would not change the predominant character of the surrounding area. The uses provide a direct service or convenience to the neighborhood. Um, the uses have also demonstrated to be reasonably compatible with the surrounding uses and also have mi minimal negative impacts. The operating characteristics are appropriate um, and the parking is shared with the residential uses. So the current um, hours of operation allow that parking to be shared by residents overnight and then utilized during the day by the office uses. In terms of the parking reduction, staff finds that that proposed 22% parking redu reduction is consistent with the criteria. The parking has proven to be sufficient for the uses and without undue impacts on the neighborhood for the time since it's been established. The parking needs of the use are adequately served. Um, there is accessible off-street parking or on-street parking in the vicinity. And um, as I describes the parking is shared between the residential and non-residential uses. So it's a, it's a compatible sharing arrangement. It's also approximately half mile walk from Broadway, which is served by high frequency transit routes like the skip. And as I described, they're providing additional short-term bike, bike spaces um, to encourage people to use alternative modes of transportation. Um, so based on that, staff recommends approval of the proposal with the uh, motion shown on the screen. And as always, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Sloan. Uh, excellent presentation. Very, very informative. So let's go ahead and uh, ask if any uh, board members have any questions for Sloan on this. John. Yeah, uh, thanks for a good presentation. Uh, would this have any impact uh, on the ability of uh, owners to change the use of, of their various space between residential and uh, office and commercial within that development? So this use review only pertains to the five non-residential spaces that are located on the sort of ground level of the development, the five residential units would not be um, affected by this proposal and they wouldn't be able to convert those to a non-residential use without another use review. I see, so so any conversion in, in either direction would require a use review uh, before approval? I think if they wanted to convert the non-residential to a residential use, I'm not sure a use review would be required because they'd be reducing the impacts. Um, but just the way the building is set up, they I mean, they would have to meet building code for a residential use. I think there would be some other review processes that they would need to go through. If I- Actually, uh, well- Yeah, I mean, applicants can, um, answer as well, but they don't currently have water or sewer hookups to the um, non-residential spaces. 
Yeah, yeah, John. The uh, the commercial spaces don't those com those five commercial units don't have uh, any kitchens or bathrooms internal to the units. It's all um, a shared facility that is off that atrium that Sloan mentioned, which is how you gain access to those particular locations. So, um, you know, I, I I think they would fail to meet whatever um, criteria would be required to convert them into. Um, residential spaces without pretty substantive work uh, on the building itself. Okay, thank you, Mr. McGurk. And I, I guess you'll have a chance to to make those points in, in after the staff presentation. But I guess my question was um, to can, staff. Could, could I could, could I just interrupt? Um, I just wanted for the record state that that was uh, Mike McGurk, uh, the applicant for this uh, item. So that it's on our recording. Thank you. Go ahead, John. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, my question, I understand that there are, there would be physical changes and taps and all that kind of stuff required, but if, if the owners of these units wanted to change and they received HOA approval to do so, I'm just wondering what the process within the city would be to uh, approve that conversion or change. It would be, I mean, hypothetically, they would, it would be an allowed use in the RL2 zone. So I would imagine that we might just want to do a minor modification to the PUD to sort of document the change since it is part of this planned sort of community center. But it was always um, planned to be a mix of uses. Thank you. Thanks, John. Any other questions for Sloan? All right, well, uh, then we'll move on to uh, the applicant uh, presentation. I was told maybe you don't really have a formal presentation, um, Mike, but uh, feel free to share with us and anything you want about this and then we can, we'll have a question and answer period as well. Um, sounds good, David, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, my name is Mike McGurkin. I'm, uh, uh, my wife Sue and I are owners of one of the residential units here at 77. Seven Poplar. Um, you know, other than a short stint in Boston in the mid teens, we've been owner occupants in this building um, for the last 15 years. So, in addition to being, um, in addition to being, well, I guess I would have considered us long term owners until I heard how long John was in the area. But uh, um, I'm also the president of the condo association here. We're a relatively small association, but um, we do represent the interests of those. Um, the owners of those five uh, commercial um, offices that are in this in this building here, as well as the uh, the other locations around the site. Um, and, you know, David, you're right. We didn't we talked about preparing something a little bit more formal, a presentation for the uh, for the discussion. But um, you know, to be honest, when you look at the package that Sloan and the team put together, it was thorough enough and comprehensive enough. It seemed like anything we would say would just be redundant. So. Um, you know, it didn't really seem like it was worth wasting time or uh, pulling everybody through the knot hole of a formal presentation. I figured I would just offer a little bit of uh, history and context and then, um, you know, we could take it back to uh, the question and answers and if there's anything specific that, um, that we can address. So um, I think like Sloan mentioned, we got into this process probably about 18 months ago when a, uh, um, a, a real estate attorney was actually looking to buy one of these office spaces that was open. Um, turns out he's probably the first guy in 40 years that went back and did the level of due diligence to, uh, to find um, this particular situation out. Uh, like Sloan also mentioned, the current owners and a lot of the previous owners of these units, um, you know, prototypical um, bolder small business owners, right? Sole proprietors, aromatherapy, uh, clinical therapy, um, herbal supplements, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, not exactly the kind of people I would have expected to go and, and necessarily do the, that level of due diligence. Um, you know, that said, they're still friends, they're neighbors, they're a part of the association. And so we as the association thought, you know, it really is in our interest to make sure um, that we do right by them and that we can get, uh, we can get the situation sorted out with the city so that they can freely trade on those um, properties as they, they feel like they need to. Um, you know, originally when we got into this, we thought this was going to be a pretty low level of effort uh, uh, activity. We didn't, we didn't think it was going to be a whole lot of work. We, we assumed, uh, you know, if you look at the way that property is situated, there's two commercial buildings on either side. 
The building's 40 years old and it's had commercial usage since the beginning. Um, you know, if you come to the building, you can see that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the residences, they're going to have private entrances and they also have uh, individual um, natural gas furnaces, whereas these this commercial space is all accessed via, you know, a shared atrium with a shared boiler and baseboard heating. Um, you know, the, the, these commercial offices don't have kitchens and bathrooms. That's all a shared facility that hangs off of that atrium. So, you know, we thought really with, uh, with, with all of that data that, um, you know, it'd be relatively simple to get, uh, to get some approval on this, that, uh, um, you know, that, that there was a director determination or something that we could use to, to kind of quickly put this thing to bed. Uh, it turns out that wasn't the case and that a formal use review was needed and that um, uh, because of the parking reduction, it was going to end up back in front of this, uh, back in front of this group to, uh, to actually adjudicate it anyway. Um, which is, which is fine. Cause I think just like the, uh, when we thought it was a low level of effort, we as a condo association just decided to run at the problem. And let's just try and get this thing sorted as quickly as we can. So, um, you know, it's been something of a, a, a of a long process, eighteen months. But I like to think that, um, you know, as the as the owners in this, we've been supportive and uh, you know upbeat, positive on the whole process, even when it's kind of bogged down, gotten a little slow, or some we've hit some frustrating milestones in the in the project. Um, but overall, you know, we've been um, you know very pleased. And I think if you look at the package, if you look at the documentation, you'll see. Um, not an inconsequential amount of work went into preparing this use review. Um, you know, we basically sifting through 40 years worth of history, some of it ready available, a lot of it wasn't readily available and, you know, required some digging to, to go find it. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess on a personal note, I would say it's, uh, it certainly has been a lot of work, but in a lot of ways, it's, uh, it's been kind of interesting too. Um, you know, not not to get too geekish on the whole history of the building and all that, but uh, you know, it was kind of cool to figure out why it was called the Village Center, right? I mean, it used to be the hub of this whole uh, development up here on Wonderland Hill, and uh, you know, we found out that the building next door um, actually was a convenience store when it first opened up, and you know, it serves you know all the houses around here, and we found some local signage from the from the early days, and we met the son of the owner from uh, one of the of, of that convenience store back at the very beginning so it's 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 been kind of cool i mean it's been a little bit of a a, a process but uh but it's been interesting to kind of collect a bunch of history on the site and location and what's been what's been going on here for the last 40 years um i won't say that it's been fun but i will say that it's been interesting so it uh it's it it, it, it hasn't really been too bad and I think on that, on the output of the process, a lot of the things that we got from Sloan and the team, the recommendations, the writers on the motion, that sort of thing, have all been really good. I mean, obviously, um, you know, where we sit and the kinds of activities that we host, the, uh, you know, bike traffic is a, is a big deal, right? Like, and particularly during the summer months, there's a lot of bike commuters that come up this way. So we, um, so I think those kinds of recommendations um, that, you know, hey, improve the bike parking, do these sorts of things, we're all good to hear. I mean, because it's all what we want to do to keep the property kind of current anyway, and uh, and keep it improved. So, so it was all good. So, um, you know, like I said, I just wanted to put a little bit of context and history on this uh, on this proposal and how we got here. Um, you know, I, I like I said, building's been around for forty years. And we've been able to trace you know the business usage back um, pretty much right to the beginning of that time. Um, you know, the units, the complex, it's, it's very tightly integrated into the neighborhood. Um, you know, not just the condo association that we are, but, you know, we, na we know our neighbors and the residences that are around the building and all those sorts of things. In the 15 years that I've been here, I don't think we've heard, you know, any sorts of complaints about the businesses or the people coming and going or the traffic or the parking or any of those kinds of things. And, you know, just knowing the owners here and that we would have addressed those things relatively quickly, I guess I find it a little bit hard to believe that anybody's ever really complained about it. I think it's always been just a part of the community up here. And, uh, and I'm just kind of hoping that we can make that official and, uh, and, and keep moving forward. So I appreciate, you know, all your time and attention on the matter. And uh, I'll turn it back over to whoever's next. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, um, and, uh... I'll just say it's always nice to hear 
people have good things to say about the public processes that can be frustrating. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I, I know it's uh, it's helpful for staff to hear, hear positive feedback. Uh, so uh, with that, um, uh, do we have anyone else uh, representing this? Uh, I, I see our illustrious uh, uh, ex-board member Harmon Zuckerman is on, but um, uh, I don't know if if Harmon was going to weigh in at all on this one, or but otherwise we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, any questions for the applicant on this? Oh, well, there's Harmon. Hey, hi. Thanks, to see you. thanks, Dave, for the the hello. It's nice to see you all again. No, I have nothing to add. Um, just here okay. to, to 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 support. Well, it's good to see your face. Let's see it. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and open it up for uh, questions. Anybody have any questions? John, did you want to ask? Just a, a brief comment to uh, to the applicant uh, regarding uh, his uh, thought that no one had ever complained about it. And uh, I can tell you that when the uh, convenience store closed down, that was where all the kids got their candy and ice cream in the neighborhood. And they complained bitterly at the time. But that was more than 15 years ago, I can say. So just just thought you might you be aware of that. I guess maybe but, uh, maybe because it, maybe because it's a short walk to Lucky's Market, people have forgotten. But uh, I've I've often thought that if uh, Vance Martin ever wanted to sell the Wild Foundation, I'd love to bring a convenience store back into that building. That'd be great. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Great. Any more uh, questions or comments? All right, with seeing none, then let's go ahead and move on to the public hearing. Uh, this is the time where uh, anyone from the public can address us on uh, the item before us right now um, on Poplar. So uh, again, please do raise your hands in the participants uh, as a participant. And if you would like to speak, you'll have three minutes. So I'm looking to see if anyone is raising their hand. And we'll give it uh, 10 more seconds here just to make sure people aren't having trouble finding the raise hand button. And I don't see any public comment. So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, close that public hearing for this item and uh, ask, I guess, uh, the uh, Mike, there's really no reason for you to rebut anything that we just heard. So <laughs> we can probably skip the rebuttal unless you had anything else you'd like to add. Uh, so we, we'll go ahead and move on then to our our board uh, action portion. Uh, we have uh, two key issues that Sloan uh, put up for us, and uh, uh, I think we can just organize our discussion on the key issues. Uh, key issue one is the proposed proposal consistent with the use review criteria set forth in our uh, municipal code. Anyone want to comment on? Uh, should we uh, like uh, do thumbs up on it, and then you can raise your hand if you want to say anything. So people are pretty comfortable with it being consistent with the code. Um, and key issue two is the requested parking reduction consistent with the criteria for parking reduction set forth in the city code. Also, thumbs up on that one. All right. Well, it looks like then uh, that we're pretty comfortable on the key issues. Um, you know, I'll just say that, uh, you know, little neighborhood centers are things that kind of make our, our town interesting. And uh, I found it quite, quite informative to look into this and learn about something that I wasn't really aware of since I live on the other side of town. So uh, very interesting. Uh, so if there if there isn't any additional discussion maybe someone would like to make a motion can you put the motion up on the screen can the motion yeah, Sloan, if you, the that would make does that mean you, you would like to make it sarah or just just so whoever makes it it's right there <laughs> sorry great well, anyone can speak up and i'm i'm happy to make the motion Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so a motion to approve land use review number LUR 2021-00030 and administrative review number ADR 2022-00033 
incorporating the staff memorandum, including its attachments as findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, do we have a second for that motion? I see John second. Thank you, John, for seconding that motion. Uh, so um, is there any discussion on the motion? If not, I will restate the motion by Sarah, uh, seconded by John, motion to approve uh, land use review number LUR 2021-00030 and administrative review number ADR 2022-00033, incorporating the staff memorandum, including its attachments as findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Uh, so I will go ahead and uh, put this up for the vote then. Uh, Sarah. Aye. John. Aye. Georgie. Aye. Lisa. Aye. And I vote aye, so that's a unanimous approval. Congratulations, uh, Mike and Harmon. Thank you for that really interesting presentation. And I wish all our meetings were this easy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> David, if I can ask, is this your last planning board meeting? I have one more. You have one more. Well, if I don't, if I don't, I've showed up for two in a row for one reason or another. If I don't show up for the next <laughs> one, I wanted to congratulate you on five years on yeah. planning board and, uh, and congratulate the board for the way that it's worked together with you and, uh, and your last year as chair. Um, you've done a wonderful job and it was a pleasure serving with you. And, uh, and I just think that it's a great, uh, the whole organization is great. We walked um, through this process with a virtual all-star team of, of city staff directly working with Charles and Hella at the beginning and then Sloan took it home and um, wanted to thank them for this as well. Well, thank you so very much. That's uh, so much appreciated. And uh, for those who might be attending from the public, Carmen was our chair last year and in his last year on planning board and it was a, a real pleasure. I think we can all say to work with you as well. So thank you for that. Thank you all. And uh, great, with that, we'll go ahead and close that public hearing item, uh, ag um, agenda item number five, and move on to num agenda item number six, which is matters uh, from the planning board, planning director and city attorney. Uh, we have one scheduled uh, uh, agenda item of use table and standards project update and module one introduction. Uh, and uh, I, we're, Excited to have, I think this is your first presentation to us, Lisa. Uh, Lisa Howd, uh, uh, who works with Carl and Charles. And so I'll let you, the, the team, take it over and walk us through this. Great, thanks right. so much. Sure. Lisa, please take it away. All right, thanks Charles. Thanks Chair, good evening planning board. I'm excited to be here and to meet some of you. I've met a few of you over the last couple of weeks, and I am really excited to talk about the use table and standards project. You may remember that you last heard about this project back in August of 2020, so it's been a while. So I'm going to provide a update on the project and also introduce you to the next steps of the project under what we're calling module one. So in this presentation, I'm gonna kind of go back to where we've been with this project, talk about what we've heard, and then talk about where we're going in the future. So going back to where we've been, this project was actually first initiated back in 2018. So it's been going on for a few years and we did the first phase of the project in 2019. And that was really focused on the opportunity zone areas and the zoning districts related to that. There was significant public engagement on the overall project during 2019. And we also formed a planning board subcommittee that started to meet. And I will talk a bit more about that on another slide. But the phase one was completed towards the end of 2019. And then we started phase two in early 2020. So, uh, something happened in early 2020 that threw everything uh, for a loop and this project, um, we were able to complete some public engagement during the summer of 2020, all virtual of course, and the subcommittee continued to work virtually uh, diligently on this project. So we got a good amount of work done on phase two in 2020, but unfortunately we had to pause the project in the fall of 2020 um, due to the staffing levels and the issues uh, with the department due to the pandemic. So it's been paused since then, but uh, we're excited to restart the project and take off where we stopped. Just a reminder of what the initial goals of this project were. 
um, initially to simplify and streamline the regulations, making them more understandable and legible, just general user friendliness of the use table. If you've ever dug into it, it is quite complex. Um, also creating some more predictability and certainty with the use standards, which are um, what are tied to the use table. And then just trying to align the use table and the permitted uses with the Boulder Valley Comp Plan policies and goals. And then another big part of the project and something the subcommittee talked a lot about um, was identifying where there might be land use gaps or the uses that the community desires, but the use table is actually acting as a barrier to those uses um, subsisting in the city. And I already talked a bit about the subcommittee, but I did want to talk, just um, emphasize how much work was done by these um, three members of the planning board um, who were on the subcommittee. They met over 20 times in between 2018 and 2020. And despite the pause in the project, I really just wanted to, to make the point that that input and every, all of that excellent work continues to guide the project and inform and will inform the project moving forward. So. They really dug into the use table, did a district by district analysis of all the uses, all of the lines of the table. Um, they really got into it. And me coming into this project, it's really excellent to have, you know, 100 pages of minutes to go through and talk and see all of the things that have been talked about already by the subcommittee. So uh, we're excited to put those into action as we move this project forward. And one of the big outcomes from the subcommittee work was talking about these areas of consideration. And that's something you would have heard about in your last update. If you're a visual person, you might remember that there was a Venn diagram that was developed with all of these different areas of consideration. We've redesigned it a bit, but it's still all the same content. Um, but what the planning board subcommittee uh, decided upon were these areas of consideration for the project. So incorporating administrative and structural updates encouraging 15 minute neighborhoods and walkability and supporting mixed use nodes along corridors and also within neighborhood centers. So all of these different things to consider as part of the project. And then there's many that actually meet all of those different categories. So we have a lot of guidance moving forward with this project thanks to all of that excellent work. You would have seen in your packet, we attached a new draft project charter. So there was one developed in early 2020 um, that we were we have updated and it was actually a good opportunity to kind of use it as a retrospective and think about all of the work that had been completed in phase one and the parts of phase two that we had already done. And it was a place where we were able to summarize all of the great public input that we received through um, the public engagement that was done at that time as well. The project charter has also been updated with a new project timeline and scope of work and a new engagement plan and I'll get into that later. I also wanted to touch on what we've heard so far in that public engagement. You all received briefings on this, so I don't want to get too much in the details since, um, since you would have already heard about this, but I did want to remind you of all the work that was done for public engagement during the first phase of the project and the early second phase. So back in 2019, when we were able to do in-person engagement, uh, there were open houses and events and neighborhood office hours, and we also tied that with some virtual engagement with like a interactive mapping exercise where we got great feedback on the overall use table project. And then there was the general public hearing process for those opportunity zone related updates that were made for phase one. This is very high level overview of what we heard, but just a summary of the feedback that continues to guide the project. Uh, we heard from the people who responded that there was support for updating the outdated use categories, exploring opportunities for mixed use in other areas of the city, um, interest in adding more innovative housing types through the use table. And then maybe we heard a little bit of less interest in updating required amounts of uses or design standards. As I mentioned, we were also able to do public engagement during phase two of the project, although it was all virtual. Um, but we still had a great questionnaire that was available in the summer of 2020 and received over 80 responses. That questionnaire, we got a lot of help from the subcommittee in developing those questions. And it was really focused on kind of that neighborhood serving uses part of the project. So we have a lot of great feedback related to that. And I'll just summarize that briefly as well. Um, from those people that responded, we heard a majority of people were open to a greater mix of uses in the neighborhood centers and within a 15 minute walk. Um, and then we also got some feedback at that time on the more functional or structural 
updates to the table and people, the majority of people responding were open to streamlining the use table and consolidating some of the similar uses we have like restaurants and offices. So that's a really, really high level overview of all the engagement, but there's a lot more detail in that project charter and all of the various memos and things that have done, been done for this project over time. So now, now we're at present day, we're gonna talk about where we're going with the rest of this project. As you would have seen in the memo, we've decided to break the next phase or the second phase of this project into what we're calling three different modules. And so this is a really complex project. It's a lot to take in. So we wanted to put this into kind of three different topics that are more easily digestible. Um, and starting off with just the technical and administrative um, fixes, we're calling it the functional fixes. And so we wanna do that first so that we're kind of starting with a clean slate when we make those substantive edits that would happen in the later modules. So we're hoping to get through this functional fix phase in this spring, and then we'll move into the second module, which will focus on industrial districts and the uses in the industrial districts, um, as well as implement any of the recommendations in the East Boulder subcommunity plan that might align with specific uses in the use table. The third module will focus really on those neighborhood serving uses. So the 15 minute neighborhoods, neighborhood centers, all the things that we've gotten a lot of great public feedback already, but it's gonna have a robust public engagement effort at that time as well. So the goal is to complete this whole project by the end of the year, um, maybe, at, maybe in the first couple months of 2023. So it's, um, a great amount of work to get done, but I think dividing it into these three modules will make it easier to analyze and interpret at that time. So let's talk about the functional fixes. In your memo, they were described basically within these five different categories. And these are kind of the, the, the strategies that we want to employ to improve the user friendliness of the use table really get at that streamlining and, and working on the understandability of it for most people. So the overarching thing to fix with the use table is the structure. So a use table, most cities um, that have completed a major zoning update in the last two decades, I would say, have a use table. It's definitely considered a best practice to incorporate a use table in your zoning code or your land use code. Um, Boulder was an early adopter, so we've had it longer than most people, which has given us more time to make lots of edits. And those seemingly simple fixes over time have just made the table increasingly complex. Um, and we've gotten to the point where you have to be a really savvy user of the use table to really understand how to um, interpret it and interpret where the uses are allowed. And the use table should really just be a it's an important part of the land use code, but it really should just be a reference table that tells you which uses are allowed in which district and whether there's any standards related to those uses in those districts that they need to know about and whether it might change a review process. So there's, an there's a lot of opportunities to improve this through the structure. And we, I'll talk a bit about how we think that putting things in a one consolidated section of all specific use standards could make a big difference in the user friendliness. It also gives us an opportunity to consolidate some of the similar uses that are right now requiring multiple lines in the table and just overcomplicating it. So I made this slide to describe, and this doesn't actually even show all of the different ways that use standards are described in the table, but these are the most common. So we have both use qualifiers in the use table, so descriptive terms that are actually in the row of the use table. So for restaurants, that this restaurant is over 1,500 square feet, things like that are sometimes incorporated in the rows of the table. We also have the limited use standards, which were adopted in recent years, where you would look at the line of the table and it would tell you that it has an L with a superscript. And then you actually have to go from that reference table to another reference table to learn what that actually means. So that's Having to reference two different tables is not usually a user-friendly practice, so that's difficult as well. And then we also have our conditional use and use review standards that come after the table. So there's all these different places that someone could find the standards that are related to a use. And instead of having those in so many different places, we think that it would be a lot more user-friendly for everyone using the table if they're all in one consolidated area for specific use standards. 
And that also gives us this opportunity to consolidate some of those rows that are currently being used to describe the kind of dividing lines between these different uses. So restaurants is one of our worst offenders. We have eight different lines in the use table for restaurants, um, which describe various nuanced characteristics that change the um, review process that's required. So by taking those standards out of the table and instead putting them in the specific use standard section, we're able to collapse that down from eight different lines to just one line for restaurants, brew pubs, and taverns. And an important note that I wanted to add on this slide is that at this point at in module one, the functional fixes, we're not making any substantive changes. So there wouldn't be any changes to the regulatory allowances for any of these uses. So all of those standards would still be in place. It's something we might you know, look at in more detail in the later module. But for now, these would all stay in place. They would just be re relocated to a more user-friendly location where people can actually understand and comprehend what these rules are meant to, meant to describe. So that's, and um, the structural is the biggest thing to restructure and do the specific use standards. But there's also another big opportunity to improve the user-friendliness of the use table. And this is gonna get very into the weeds of zoning code drafting. So bear with me, I put some colors on the slide to try to spice it up. But um, with, the, with that consolidation, we do have an opportunity to improve the abbreviation approaches that we use in the table to make that more clear. Right now, uh, if you're familiar with the use table, A means allowed, C means it's a conditional use, U means that you need a use review. And then we have all those other like L superscript and things like that. But at the basics, those are the three. And so what we did was we looked at a lot of other cities, both in Colorado and around the country to see what they were doing with their use tables. And there, a lot of people or a lot of cities do it in a very similar way, but they might take a, a different approach with these abbreviations. So we're trying to think about what would be the most user-friendly for the most people. And there's no real right or wrong answer. We're just trying to find that more user-friendly approach. So I will, I'll describe these kind of three most common approaches. The first one, A, is able to show you that there are different review processes in districts for the same use. And so most cities do that where there might be a dividing line, like say a size. So for restaurants, this is why I've circled the um, MU3. For restaurants in the MU3 district, you're allowed by right if you're under a thousand square feet, but if you're larger than a thousand square feet, you need a use review. So there's two different review process paths that might happen for a restaurant in that district. And so in the approach A, you're able to see that there are different review processes. For all of these approaches, there would be text before the table that would tell you that you need to look at the right-hand side column of the table to see where the standards that would tell you what that line is between the um, allowed and use review is. So, um, in approach B, which a lot of cities do use as well, that's the most simplistic approach, I would say. And all it does is show the most permissive use review, and then you'd have to go look at the, um, the additional references on that right-hand side to see if it might, you know, if I'm larger than 1,000 square feet, then I'm going to have to get a use review. And one of the downsides with both A and B is that not every... Um, standard related to a use is related to a review process. So we do have standards that are, you know, cut and dry, just a standard related to a, a use, um, an impact of that use. So for example, in RH3 and RH7, which I've also circled, in that option C, we're using a symbol to indicate kind of as a heads up to people that there's something that applies here and you need to go look at that right-hand side column to be able to understand exactly um, what applies. So in RH3 and RH7, there is just a limitation of size on restaurants and there's no option for use review. So there's not a difference between review process, there's just a standard for that. And we do have a lot of uses that just have those kind of standards. So um, option or uh, approach C is able to show both those standards and review process differences in the way that the other ones can't. Can I, can I just ask a question, Lisa? Yeah. So please. in all three of these, the, it's the 9-6-6X that would take you, the, the, an applicant, to if it's a restaurant of this size that's open at this hour, blah, 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 blah. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's where the consolidated specific use standard would really become helpful because you just click there and that's everything about restaurants and you just find the part that's about MU3 and then you'd know. So yeah, that would be, yeah, that's the next step. And, and, and thank you, Sarah. I was actually going to suggest maybe we open it up to questions on this particular slide um, since you just talked about it and I think there might be some questions. Uh, yeah, I know great. I have a couple. Uh, great. Were you done with the slide? And then we can just yeah, yeah. start talking. Happy to take yeah. questions on these ones. Yeah, these were kind of the biggest, the hardiest ones. So good time. Okay. So one one that I one that I saw was um, in approach C. Uh, well, why wouldn't all the C's have brackets? Because whenever you have a C, you're going to have to reference the the section. So I was just kind of wondering what it meant to not have brackets for a C. So that is an interesting quirk of the use table, which I have learned by digging into that the C does not actually always mean that there are used or there are conditional use standards related to it. So that's also a problem that we currently have because the C is meant to indicate that there's always conditional use standards <laughs> related to it, um, but it's not actually been done consistently. So there are several uses that are conditional with no specific standards related to them. I think the vast oh. majority of C's would have brackets. Right. But in the, um, but the ones that don't have brackets then uh, mean that uh, it's just the general conditional standards Correct. that that apply, and that's that's just summarized somewhere in the in a general section. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, Sarah. Um, so it's not on this particular example but um, we have brought up to staff before the vagueness of the N slash A um, oh, yeah. standard. Um, and I don't know, we still don't know what that means because it seems to be something that happens behind the, the curtain. So I'm hoping that in this process that will get clarified for applicants and board members as well. Absolutely, the NA was quite confusing for me coming in and looking at the use table and with these approaches, we would get rid of all of those. So there would no there would no longer be any NA. You would it would just be a line in the use table for each use, and then you go to the specific use standards for those uses. Awesome. Cue the confetti. <laughs> <laughs> so I I also um, had another uh, one that caught my eye in uh, approach C with the um, MU one uh, with restaurants. It I, it just seems odd to me that that wouldn't wouldn't have brackets around it because. Um, I thought all, I mean, for example, in the downtown, I thought all of the zones had some specific language around the size and things like that. So is that, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's another interesting quirk is once I dug into those uh, restaurant sections, um, it actually allows, and I might not be getting the exact numbers correct, but it allows both restaurants under a thousand square feet and uh, allows restaurants over a thousand square feet. And it allows restaurants with a patio under a third of the floor area and over a third of the floor area and that opened before and after 11 p.m. So in that way, they just canceled each other out and there weren't any standards related to it. Interesting. There, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, that, that reveals another issue with the table is that you weren't able to see that there wasn't actually a standard related to ME1. And Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think we could take those C's that don't have the brackets if we were to go that direction. And those could become A with brackets because any, any parameters on some of those that just might have, you know, a square footage or something would just be A with brackets, right? Correct. If, there, so, yeah. if there's no process. So yeah, another part of this is making sure that that C issue that I was talking about before where the C is just indicating that there might be something related to it, but not actually a conditional use required. Um, so making sure that that's done consistently. So there are some places where um, it's just a standard and it doesn't actually kick you up into a conditional use. So it's, it's confusing. It's taken me a while to understand um, how that's working in the table right now, but we would clean that up. Like community gardens, for example, is a C in the table, but we do not require a conditional use application process for them. There are standards, but it's just generally something that's over the counter that people agree to. So that's something that I think we would change to an A with brackets. So there wouldn't be a process. Right, that makes so total sense. Yeah, that's an, a, an example of a change over time where 
it was decided that the C would just indicate that there were standards you needed to look at. Um, so it's just been done in, inconsistently. Great. Any other questions on this slide before we move on? No, but can I right. can I make a comment on an earlier slide? We don't you don't actually have to move the slide backwards. Sure. Um, and I think I had probably said something akin to this when we spoke earlier. Um, on module three, uh, the slide that has module three on it, I'd really like to encourage you to make it um, fifteen minute neighborhoods slash neighborhood centers because. Um, they're both important um, and have will have different interests from the public, um, and I just think it's more it would it more fully captures what it is uh, that third module will focus on. Just a thought. No, that's a great point, and we can definitely make that change in the project charter and everything moving forward. So thanks. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right. Ready thanks to for dig in thanks more? for taking. Oh. Oh, did you have another question? Uh, let's um, let's only uh, do questions on this slide um, and save our big other questions for later. John, go ahead. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, maybe more of a comment than a question. I, I'm all in favor of making making these tables as easy to use as possible, um, but at the same time, I would like to make sure that the city doesn't lose any of its control or discretion, uh, you know, the substance of what is contained in these tables, uh, uh, just because we're trying to make the tables uh, simpler and, and more direct to use. So, uh, you know, I think what you're doing is fine, but let's not lose control <laughs> is, my, is my thought here. Absolutely. That's understood. And that's something we're being really diligent about as well. We're reshuffling and recategorizing that we're not losing any of the existing standards. We're not losing any of the existing review processes that are required there. There won't be any changes to the regulatory allowances. And that's one of the benefits of splitting this work into three different modules is that we can really focus on just this reorganization part without, you know, muddying it up with more, you know, with the substantive changes, basically, so that we can really focus on those substantive changes once we get to them. But this is just really the reshuffle and recategorize. Very good. That said, then, um, since we are on that uh, topic, uh, we heard from the public earlier um, about uh, the, the idea with the uh, module one changes, if we were to uh, consolidate uh, public and private schools, uh, it, it would be a, a, a substantive change then uh, to allow the, the private schools. Uh, um, but I know that with the schedule would certainly make the watershed folks happy if it, if it were part of module one. Um, is that on the table for, for module one? The, so the substantive changes like where schools are allowed in the districts would not be part of module one because we're trying to keep it at this non-substantive, you know, just fixing um the functional parts of the table however with especially with that example um public schools are allowed everywhere private schools are allowed by use review in most places um, they're prohibited in the industrial districts for example um, so basically the it would become just schools not private or public and the it would keep the same lines in the table that private has currently the more restrictive and then there would be a standard that says that public schools are allowed in all districts because they're actually um, exempt anyway for most uh, types of public school. So there, there was no need for that line in the table anyway. So I hope that makes sense that it would, the, the cells in the table would remain the same. The name of the use would become just schools instead of private or public schools. But it sounds, if you like, do the, it sounds like the, the policy question is kicked down the the road a little bit from it's not going to be in module one of this right. of this process it wouldn't be because it's not that would be a change to the regulatory allowance um, for that but that's something that certainly we would look at in the industrial district module because they are prohibited in industrial districts and then probably we would look at it also in the neighborhood module as well and I think the planning board could direct us to make substantive changes and then we could do that analysis and incorporate into the module two or module three. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that um, 
yeah, there will be opportunity to work on that in module three for sure, right? Um, and module two, actually, because that's uh, industrial. Uh, uh, and, and I do believe watershed uh, is interested in um, an industrial zone because uh, it, it has uh, available property that is affordable to them. Um, but I just want to make sure because I, I feel like the expectation we heard um, during the public comment was that they felt like the structural changes might do that. And that's not necessarily going to be the case uh, because it is a more substantial change. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that would be that correct. correct? Yeah. yeah, because once yeah. I mean, when we combine those uses, they would still be a school. So the the those same um, allowances in the district wouldn't change at this point in the process. But it's certainly something that we can look at um, in the later parts of the project later this year. Okay. All right, we can talk a little bit more about that maybe later. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah. Let's thanks. let's move on through the presentation, and then we'll have more question and answer, I'm sure. Great. All right, so another one of the strategies beyond the structural and abbreviation types things is actually looking at all of the uses in the use table and the words and the definition and just trying to keep things up to date. It's something that every city has to do with their zoning code over time as uses change and evolve and businesses change. So we'd be looking at things like newsstands and travel agencies and data processing centers that might be overly specific uses that we don't have a ton of anymore and maybe don't need to be called out specifically in the use table. Um, also just looking at common terminology. So things interesting, we've been talking about schools. We talk about junior high schools, but actually nowadays they're usually called middle schools. So looking at making sure we're using those common terms that people use um, now rather than when maybe it was first put into the zoning code in the 1940s. So that's <laughs> another strategy. And then another big part of this is actually not in the use standards chapter, but it's in the definitions because the definitions are tied with those use names, the use types. So we'll be looking at the definitions of all the uses in the table with kind of these lenses. Um, first, that all use types should be defined. We actually do a pretty good job of that so far. There's just a few that don't have a definition. Um, so we'd be crafting definitions for those. And then looking at the existing definitions and the names of uses and making sure that they're all clear and concise and they're using common terms. So we'd look at some uses like offices or personal services, which have common issues of interpretation because the definitions are vague or unclear or they use um, maybe uncommon examples. And then also just looking at some of the use types that have very long names or um, ones that aren't exactly portraying exactly what they are intended to mean. So we'd be looking at all of those. And then we'd also look at opportunities to use definitions to facilitate the consolidation of similar uses. So there's things like temporary outdoor events and temporary sales, which are currently two different lines in the use table, um, but we process them through the exact same permit. They have very similar standards. So it makes a lot of sense to just consolidate those into one. Private and public schools, um, is something else that we've already talked about that could be consolidated um, based on impacts. And then uh, the adult educational facilities and vocational schools, those are also two different lines in the table um, that could be consolidated because they're quite similar. And all of this work to clarify definitions is gonna be informed by looking at our business licenses, looking at past interpretations, and also doing a lot of research of peer cities to see how other cities are defining uses and whether there's um, better definitions we can use or tweaks that we need to make for things that are unique and bolder and things like that. So uh, not to say that the definitions work would end in module one. I think there'd still be a lot of work to do in module two and three, but these are really just the high level clarifying uh, changes that would be made to the definitions. And then the final strategy is actually related to use categories. So much like a scientific classification, we think that it would be very helpful for the use table to be consistently using um, categories to group the uses. So we actually already do that in the residential and commercial use tables, um, but we don't do it consistently throughout the table. So essentially what this would do is put each use type, which is the row in the table within a category of uses that share some similar features or impacts. Um, so for example, I have on the screen detached dwelling units would be within the category of household living and that would be within the classification of residential uses. So 
really just trying to create some more consistency there. I think that would also be really helpful for interpretation issues when we have new uses that come up that are not in the table to try to understand what they're most similar to. So that one's just a cleanup to try to uh, improve the usability of the table and make it as intuitive as possible for everyone that's using it. Using it. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, I guess I'm not remembering um, where in the use table these cat these types of categories appear, and maybe it's just because I haven't looked for a month, but I'm I just don't recall. Yeah, sure. So it's actually they're most commonly used in the commercial section. There's service uses and vehicle related uses. Oh, okay. Um, things like that. And then in the residential category, there's actually already a group quarters and an accessory category. So those are the only ones where the categories exist, but that's how they've been used. Okay, thank you. Sure. So that was actually the final strategy. And that I was just going to go over the next steps would be to draft these ordinance changes. We're hoping to bring a draft ordinance before you in mid to late May. And so we'll also be crafting an engagement window to hear from the public on the user friendliness of the use table prior to that. And then we'd also like to either reconvene the subcommittee, um, we've lost or are about to lose some of the members of the subcommittee over time. So um, there is an opportunity to either reconvene with two new members or um, rethink it, rethink the format of the subcommittee and maybe um, act more like a focus group and we could bring in some more involvement from members of the public or things like that. So um, love to hear if anyone has any thoughts on that as well. And then after we get through the ordinance for the functional fixes, that's when we'd start taking on the analysis for module two related to industrial districts and then module three, the neighborhood related one. So those are the next steps for the project. Um, we did include in the memo just a few guiding questions if it's helpful. Um, for your discussion, we already talked about the abbreviation, so that's great. Thanks for the pause there. Um, just generally, if you see, if you have any concerns with the path moving forward for this project or any additional feedback or any preferred approaches related to those restructuring or other comments. So I'm excited to hear uh, your feedback and any questions. So thanks. Thank you so much, Lisa. This, um... Am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Um, that was great. And uh, it's so exciting to see this coming back. Um, I, I think uh, this came out of a retreat that I was in, I think my second year on planning board. And uh, it was kind of a unique uh, structure because forming a subcommittee requires you to do public meetings and notice the meetings and everything. So uh, it's a, it was really a unique uh, approach. And I think it was uh, very useful. Um, just want to say on that slide of participants, uh, the names of the people who have been involved, uh, uh, besides me, uh, Brian Bowen and Crystal Gray were on originally. And then when Crystal left the planning board, Sarah Silver replaced her. And I believe Lisa Smith uh, then joined as well, but then we didn't have too many meetings when Lisa was on. And then uh, during the last year, um, I was still chairing the subcommittee and, uh, and Sarah and Lupita were members, but uh, we, like you said, we didn't meet. So I just wanted to, recognize all the people who have taken an interest besides the larger planning board and um yeah with that uh let's go ahead and open it up for more questions let's start with questions and then uh, we can talk through the three feedback things but before we do that shall we take a five minute stretch break does that sound good mm -hmm. all right so let's go ahead and take five minutes and then we're going to do questions for uh lisa and uh carl and then uh we'll go through the three uh, areas to provide feedback.
Thanks, Cindy, for putting up the time slide. That's always useful for people who might be joining from the public. So I see people getting back on. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, open it up to any additional questions before we uh, have our discussion. Oh, I guess I better put my headphones on so I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to bother Mike too much. Uh, he's in the condo with me. Poor guy's it's probably so tired of watching me run out and play in the snow. I think he's going to go back with somebody else tomorrow, a couple <laughs> days earlier than me. <laughs> can you put up the um, three sort of lines of inquiry that uh, Lisa and Carl were guiding us with? Great. Yeah, we'll, we can dive right into those if you'd like, if we, and we can always uh, just incorporate questions into that, into each area, if, if, um, if that makes sense. These are the three questions that have to do with module one. And I, I, um, I don't personally, I think uh, Lisa and Carl, have, it, this is as satisfying as cleaning out your closet. Like this is, this is, Organ, this is going to be so organized, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> very impressive. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, uh, my, I love the three phases. Um, I think uh, coordination with the East Boulder subcommittee plan will be key. And uh, it was expected that uh, East Boulder subcommittee plan would drive a lot of what's going on uh, with industrial zones, since uh, most of our industrial zones are in that area of the city. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, and uh, module three is uh, really kind of the dream of the whole thing. So it'll be wonderful to see us get to the neighborhood centers in 15 minute, um, 15 minute uh, neighborhoods and uh, uh, yeah, neighborhood centers. Uh, and I think that our end of year letter really, the TIS Council really showed how important that is to the planning board. There was quite a focus on that, the string of pearls and the uh, the neighborhood centers uh, around Boulder. Uh, so, um, yeah. Other comments? Sarah. So um, I do, this is, and I did raise this with um, Lisa and Carl when I spoke to them earlier this week. In module two on the industrial zones, I do realize that this is tied to the East Boulder subcommunity plan. But we have, as a planning board, had discussions previously, um, uh, starting when Harmon, I'm sure it was before Harmon as well, but uh, it, Harmon and I overlapped about the value of these industrial zones and how to make sure what, what, what needs to happen to, um, protect, I guess, um, the industrial zones, um, enough industrial zones that the small businesses uh, that operate out of there, out of those zones are able to continue and don't find themselves um, essentially pushed out because there are um, more uh, financially rewarding uses um, introduced. And I, I'm not suggesting what, the an what an answer is, but just that I think when we get to module two, that's gonna be a policy question that we really will need to address with some um, delic delicacy, I think. Great, other comments on question issue one? All right, oh, John, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just would like to say again, I think uh, it's great that you're doing this. It seems like <laughs> you have all the right thoughts. Uh, and uh, just to echo Sarah, because I've been quite involved with the East Boulder planning process, I do think that uh, that this would 
it'll be an interesting to see how we can mix this with the, both the substance and the process with uh, with the East Boulder process, which is focusing mostly on substance. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we're moving ahead in the way that you're proposing. I'm just uh, looking looking to see how we actually incorporate and, and mix those two processes. Great. And, and actually, John, that does uh, trigger, uh, you know, the fact that we have a, a subcommittee plan that is kind of helping inform module two. Module three is kind of interesting because uh, we've also noted that neighborhood centers do have some intensity density challenges, um, as, as uh, exemplified by the special ordinance uh, for diagonal uh, to do the, the, the concept review that we saw um, recently. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting to think about uh, whether there could be. Um, I, I think that we mentioned this in our letter to council. Uh, some a more comprehensive look at the neighborhood centers partnering with just use tables, uh, because it could be that we could have uh, better outcomes with regards to residential, especially right, uh, because those a lot of those residential standards. We saw that also with Macy's when we looked at that. We found out that in fact you could only build six. Uh, you know, by the zoning six uh, luxury condos or something on top of that building if we wanted to make put any any housing there. So so things like that uh, are, are interesting insights that we've had over the last couple of years. So um, I don't I'm not saying that that's something that's within the scope of this, but uh, the fact that we have a subcommittee plan of informing module two kind of says, wouldn't it be nice if we had a sub a, 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 more comprehensive planning, uh, also informing module three. So I'll just say that. George has raised his hand. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Um, I, th this all makes perfect sense to me, um, getting up to speed on it. Uh, I guess my question centers around, we, you know, we have two public comments around schools, and I, I understand that's not covered on, on module um, one. I guess my question is just, I'm trying to understand their path forward and what the timing would be as it relates to when when we get to that specific concern that they had. Just just so I understand it from from a public standpoint. Yeah. So I don't know exactly um, what their plan is or like what property they're looking at or what district it might be within. But the plan is to complete the entire project by the end of this year or at least like January, February of next year. So ideally, unless they're trying to, you know, open the new school in August, um, hopefully this would be something that would, the project would be completed in time um, for their project. Okay, yeah, thanks, that's that's really helpful. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, I was almost gonna ask if, if there were any, if any possibilities of having ahas in module one that uh, where we could, take the simplifications and make a couple of substantive changes if there was enough energy around it. Uh, you know, since the watershed folks uh, really do have a pretty compelling case, I think, but um, yeah, but it sounds like it won't be that long of a process to wait for, for the more substantial change. Sarah, did you wanna add something? Yeah, I wanna ask a follow-up to something David said about um, the module three. What would have to happen for module three discussion to translate into uh, zoning changes or uh, area planning for those um, BC one, BC two zones that are the are the future are the potential future neighborhood centers. Like, how would the discussion around the use tables, residential work, tr be translated? Uh, into actual change on the ground. What have? What are? What? What's the process? Is does there have to be ordinances that change zoning? Does there have to be a council action? I'm just trying to understand that connection. I think the the approach to the neighborhood centers dovetails, like like David said, with um, calls that we've heard for reevaluating some of the density requirements in, in zones. I think that was 
uh, what was referred to in the planning board letter. And I think that rose up to the council level. So the council just uh, gave direction on what work program items we should be looking at this year and in coming years. And one of those is like looking at um, potential changes to the density provisions in certain zones where there are barriers to new housing or permanently affordable housing. So we are looking to start that as a separate project um, later this year. So I think through the use tables, we could be thinking about that and looking at certain zones. So it ultimately would require a change to the land use code um, to change any kind of the density or residential requirements for those BC zones. Right, and so, I think we've learned a lot through two recent projects, the Diagonal Plaza partial redevelopment and then the Spruce Street project. I think we're both impacted by um, some standards that um, council was very deliberate in um, directing us to surgically change. Uh, so, so we're, we're in module two, the use table is being impacted by an area planning pro a sub community planning process, but in module three, we're not going to do area planning. Instead, we're going to focus solely on density. Like that seems to me to miss the point of planning. And well, again, I think in this case, we're focusing on, on uses and not so much the actual area planning or what the form would be or what the density would be. Like the density, you know, would be through a separate work program item that we would eventually be bringing forward to planning board, like the scoping, the, the purpose statement, you know, what we'd be looking at and getting input on that before we start coming up with options for what those changes might be. But in this particular case, module three is just looking at uses. So what, what's informing us is the Boulder Valley Cumberts of plan. So all those policies that are listed in the project charter from the beginning of the project are what are guiding us along with, you know, input from the committee. Right, so no, I, I'm, I'm under, I think I'm understanding, but I, I'm trying to highlight that we're taking two very different approaches um, one is a consequence of a subcommunity planning process, and one is kind of not associated with a planning. Pro I mean, you guys are not associated with an area or subcommunity planning process. And I, I just, I'm just want to make sure I'm articulating this as clearly as possible. I, I realize that you've gotten direction from council to focus on density, which is fine. But it's it's absent actual uh, geographic location. Like it's not we're going to do an area plan for Diagonal Plaza, for example, and that will drive our discussion about the use table, the uses in the use table for residential. Instead, it's council wants to focus on uh, you know open space requirements and density requirements. And that is what will determine the uses of the residential uses. That just, it just seems like an, an awkward, it seems like it's a little bit disconnected from actual plan, planning for, you know, yeah. cohesive, cohesive areas. I mean, obviously the ideal situation would be, you know, area plans that are localized for specific areas of the city to guide, you know, the ultimate development. But we also do have the comprehensive plan, which talks about the guidelines for neighborhood centers and areas where the city would like to see more housing, like particularly the Boulder Valley Regional Center and in, in neighborhood centers and all along, you know, like the 28th Street corridor potentially. Um, so we do have some guidance from the plan. Um, and obviously we've heard from members of the community that there are zones in those specific areas where the density provisions are, do cause a barrier to um, doing you know, housing or permanently affordable housing. Um, so that's, I think, what the guidance is from council. And I just wanted to add, I, I took, I add? I, oh, go ahead. Go no, you go ahead, Lisa, and then I'll add something. I, I was just going to add that I totally understand where you're coming from, and uh, do you see that 
there's kind of different guidance for each one of those modules. I think that just looking back at when this project started in 2018, just thinking of, of it as there were changes, there are changes that are necessary to the industrial districts and things that can be improved with how we describe uses in the industrial districts. It was the timing that there was an East Boulder subcommunity plan that was going to, you know, it was underway and we were going to get more guidance. And so that was always actually, it was always gonna be actually the last step of the project because we were gonna wait for that plan to get the guidance. Um, but now because of the pause, we've kind of stair-stepped over that. Um, so I, I just wanted to add that there, I mean, there's many other reasons to take a look at the industrial districts. It was, it's just, helpful to have the additional guidance now that the plan, the timing has worked out that we would have that guidance from the plan. Okay, thank you. And, and I just wanted to add a little color to this as well. Uh, what we did um, during the couple of years where we did the deep dive into the code and uh, we really did focus on what can be done to make our code uh, more aligned with the Boulder Valley Comp Plan? With the and we use the Boulder Valley Comp Plan as a as a driver. So what we did was a very strategic planning focused. It was limited in scope to uses, uh, and so I think we're acknowledging that in fact it, Module Three, if if it if it is just the uses, which we will have done strategic planning with uses, but it may not be the whole story, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting to acknowledge that it, it may still be okay to continue uh, on that we and I also wanted to point out that um, even though neighborhood centers were probably the most energetic part of the discussions, we also had discussions about things like live work. Uh, uh, in other zones. Um, we had uh, some ahas in mixed use zones as well. Uh, so, so there's a, so it is, you know, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of stuff that kind of goes across um, the entire city that we looked at, I think. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Any other comments on uh, key issue one? So key issue two um, would be the uh, preferred approach related to restructuring. Uh, does anyone want to kick us off on that one? I have a lot of notes and I can certainly go into my notes and, uh, all right. So um, I, I just wanted to, I, I thought limited use was such a great thing when we, got it in phase one as something that came out of Opportunity Zone. And it just is funny that it did add to the complexity. So I think it's really a good idea to make that more intuitive. Um, with the three approaches, I felt like C seemed to have the most advantage with regards to information signaling. Uh, so I felt a little more comfortable with approach C. That was just kind of my reaction. Uh, I, I like the fact that you, you're triggered to go look at the, uh, because of the brackets around the use, around the designations. Um, let's see. Yeah, we saw, we found a lot of outdated uses. <laughs> so reclassifying those is really good. Uh, you know, the, we aren't in the sixties anymore. And, um, also, I think in this section, please. no, I think my next comment would go into the uh, key issue three. So any other, any other things people want to comment on with the approach, structural approach? I think whichever the staff picks will be fine. They're all really good. Yeah. All right, any additional feedback uh, before staff moves forward with module one? So again, I'll comment and people can also add if you have other observations, but um, I do think it's uh, useful to have um, the subcommittee uh, re-energized uh, and do deep dives uh, and look at changes before the planning board. Um, I, lo I love the idea of being able to have 
more engagement from community members if uh, if uh, I think did you call it a working group or something uh, instead of calling it a subcommittee so if there's a designation change that would help others participate um, Max let's see uh, yeah I think I did cover all my other comments in that section already. David, John also had some comments. Oh, John, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think your comments are excellent there. I'm, I wonder if there's any way to retain the uh, institutional memory that we're rapidly losing, <laughs> I think with, uh, with your uh, departure from planning board. But uh, perhaps by calling it a working group, uh, it's easier to incorporate a wider range of the city's population than just a subcommittee of the planning board. And maybe even you would continue to participate in that case. Uh, anyway, I, I think your points were very good, David. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I know that when Crystal uh, went off um, and Brian went off, uh, they were you know with because it's a subcommittee you kind of have that like cone of silence that you have to have for a while so yeah if there's a way to structure it as a working group that would allow former board members to participate i'd be glad to glad to stay engaged it's a uh, it'd be really really wonderful to do so thank you for that john really appreciate it and i'm sure hella is is taking that and looking into it for us great any other comments then all right well it's exciting uh i uh, live very close to the meadows uh shopping center and i'll just I, I like to envision a lot of this around meadows uh the it's a parking intense, it's a sea of parking, <laughs> and a lot of it unused. And uh, with, a, you know, limited ways to get across dangerous intersections. So I would love to see, you know, that is my little neighborhood center that would have a really great path forward because the uses are are more flexible in our, in our code. So I'm hoping that this will really help places like that and other places in the city become more vibrant. So this is really amazing work. Thanks so much, Lisa. Hey, Great first you. presentation to Planning Board. Thank you so much for your time and attention on a very technical and structural zoning code topic. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, it's a, how to make a use table exciting and uh, fun for the Planning Board. Appreciate that. <laughs> the colors were great too. All right. Well, good. So with that, um, that takes us through our uh, matter, our main matters uh, item for tonight. Uh, any other matters uh, from uh, the planning director? Nothing from staff this evening. Okay. Anything from the board? Oh, I had a I had a question, um, and maybe this is for Cindy. Do do we have access? I, I saw on Landmarks board we got access to the interviews for the planning uh, members that are going to be joining. Um, is there a way to get? Uh, I, I don't know exactly how to access that. Oh, you know, I don't know how to access that either. I can find out though. Yeah, that'd be great. I think um, I think uh, was it Claire who sent it out uh, for the for the, there was it was segmented out and and they sent it out to the landmarks board to see all the applicants interviews. That'd be great if we could and get access the actual, to theirs. It's the actual interviews, not their applications. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The applications I think are pretty easy to get to, but I think you need yeah. a pa it's password protected to get uh, access to their interviews. Wow. Okay, I will find out how to do that. And I also um, noticed that uh, there's no place uh, on the website that says who was selected by city council. So um, I, I couldn't find it anywhere. And I was using like Twitter feeds and stuff. Because <laughs> from, from the news they, maybe because the announcements weren't made until this week. Officially. Maybe it's just, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, they, were ratified, they were ratified at council on Tuesday night. So it's a big yeah. And I'm not going to be putting them on our webpage. I'm not, I can't do that until 
um, April 1st. So once you're officially up, then I'll put them on. So, but we have one, and we have one of our new board members in on public in the attendee. <laughs> yes, that's right. And two applicants. Uh, can I ask so. a question? Um, so I see that city council is going back to in-person relatively soon. And what does that mean for us? I knew someone was going to ask that. <laughs> um, they are going to be trying a hybrid meeting on April 19th, as far as I understand. Um, don't get excited yet. We still have no answers. I have no answers. I was just in a meeting today about it with our communications folks, and they don't even know um how we're going to do it yeah i think the idea is to um, get council comfortable in a hybrid meeting environment work out some of the bugs and then start adding back boards and commissions yeah so, so we'll, I would, we'll remain remote for um you know for the foreseeable future yeah so i wouldn't even think until june like at, at the earliest because there are a lot of bugs to work out and i haven't even been trained yet <laughs> so, okay I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> you will soon enough. Right. I hope so. I'm really excited to learn and I just don't even know what to do. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other matters from the board that people would like to bring up? Hello, any, anything from city attorneys? Nothing from me. All right, uh, Cindy, any additional uh, deep uh, calendar check items? Just that I've sent a couple emails, adding a couple meetings. Um, we do have a meeting on the 31st, which we don't usually have, but um, pretty important meeting. And it's also going to be uh, in Spanish at the same time. I did learn something new this week, how to do a bilingual meeting on Zoom. So we're going to have a Spanish English meeting and um, I added another meeting on April 28th. That's going to be a regular planning board meeting. And I've added one, and, and I added a joint advisory board meeting, which is going to be four boards. It's not going to be a regular meeting per se, but it's going to be an informational meeting for you from EAB. And uh, it's going to be EAB, planning board, PRAB, and getting one, OS, OSBT. And that will be in person. Wow. So it will be on June 23rd. So basically we have a meeting pretty much every Thursday for the foreseeable, I mean, not really, but we have a lot of meetings coming up. Yeah, not in May yet though. Only two in May so far. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that'll change. <laughs> I've noticed that May, June, July are often pretty busy. So even though we try to schedule a retreat or I mean a, a recess, yeah. yeah. And our new members will be joining us on April 7th. Yeah. <laughs> so I will see, I will be on in two weeks uh, from Iceland uh, on the 31st. So bear with me because it'll be a little bit late there. And I will have done a 25 kilometer skate ski race that day. Ah. Maybe, maybe you should let Peter do the honors. I'll talk to Peter about that. Yeah. Just so that in case you fall asleep, it's not a problem for you. <laughs> well, I'm sure they make good coffee there. <laughs> uh, wow. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I think then um, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting and we'll see you on the 31st of March. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone.